Good morning. Um, so this is a, a, some, a project I've been working on for a number of years with a number of collaborators um, for the Quasi HIS team. This is funded by NSF. David Maiman is the project PI. David Tarberton, who's uh, right over here, many of you know, of course, is a, one of the co-PIs. I'm also one of the co-PIs. And there's a number of students and uh, researchers that have also participated in the project. So I'm really going to kind of uh, give an overview of the HIS, because I th think this is something that you may not be familiar with. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my part of the project, which is creating this hydromodeler application, it has some analogies to uh, what, what's happening here with CSDMS, and um, conclude with some kind of uh, thoughts here about um, how we have a number of different modeling frameworks that seem to be coming up in different communities, and what can we do to try to uh, facilitate interoperability across those different frameworks. So first, you might be asking yourself, what's QUASI? Um, so this stands for the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science Incorporated. Uh, QUASI has about 125 members. Um, and among other things, some of the priorities for QUASI is, are to uh, develop and support uh, operating research infrastructure. So this is this infrastructure to help do science. Um, and a second objective is to improve and prom promote access to uh, data information and models. So underneath that umbrella, we've had this project called the Quasi Hydrologic Information System Project. And the problem statement here, and I almost put problem in quotes because uh, we have more and more data um, that's being made available to us through sensor networks, uh, remote sensing, model output, and we need to kind of advance our techniques for handling and processing this data. Okay, so we've got the, the wealth of information, if you will. Um, how, do we, how do we leverage that effectively to do science? Now, you might say to yourself, well, I don't think we have that much data. So maybe you can rephrase this a little bit. How do I know what data is actually available and out there? So that's another kind of way to twist the problem well, if I'm doing a study in a particular area. So some of the studies that we uh, heard about over the last couple of days, especially these kind of global scale studies that depend on data sets that uh, uh, in order to parameterize more statistical models, um, being able to access this data and integrate it is a, a major challenge. And so if we can facilitate ways to do that more effectively, then we can hopefully advance science. Um, so the HIS goal here, uh, really, to serve science. So I'm not going to be doing a lot of uh, hydrologic science here in this presentation. Uh, you might call it information science, but it's tools and techniques to help um, facilitate hydrologic science. Um, the way that we've set up this system, the design this HIS system, um, first thing you need to understand is we've made a decision early on to keep the data distributed. So some of you might be familiar with things like uh, OpenDAP, for example, and it follows a similar kind of paradigm. We keep the data where the data lives. So keep the data with the data publisher. But we create mechanisms where we can query that data uh, through things called web services. So we can go and look in those databases and see what information is in there, create what we call a metadata catalog that facilitates search. And you can create little scripts or tools that um, can go off and fetch data on the fly and assemble it. And the key here is standardization. So that's something I'm going to talk about a number of times. And there's a lot of analogies here you can make between uh, data integration, model integration, um, that, you, that might come out through this talk. And I'll try to emphasize through this talk. Um, but if we can create standards for data access, for interfaces, for these databases, for data communication, uh, protocols, then it becomes a lot easier to integrate this information together. The software has, is less sophisticated, uh, has to be less sophisticated, which means less code to maintain, more robust application. Okay, so uh, this is our triangle diagram here to help describe the HIS in kind of simple terms. We're really thinking think about the HIS as three different components. Um, first, we have the hydromodeler, uh, sorry, hydro server component. Okay, so um, this is where the data resides. So if you want to set up your own hydro server, we have software for doing that. I have a slide coming up to describe that in more detail. And so you load in your observational data into hydro server, and then it puts it out onto the internet. Uh, we have something called uh, HIS Central. So this is maintained at the San Diego Supercomputing Center. 
And this is basically looking at these Hydra servers and looking at metadata for those servers and creating a metadata catalog. Um, and then we have client applications. Our primary client ap application we call Hydra Desktop. And this is kind of the portal into the system. All right, so if you want to go and query and find out where there's information, you would use a, a client application like Hydra Desktop to do that. So the important point here is that the data sits in these servers. We harvest metadata and centralize that, but all the data stays distributed. So that when you do a query, you might look for information in, uh, on central to find out what's available, but then when you actually want to go get the data, you go and get it back from one of these servers. So we like to kind of maybe draw the analogy here between this setup and the way the internet works in general. So you have a number of different uh, servers out there. They're being indexed by search engines. You do a search against uh, Google. Google has got a cached version of that website that it looks at. Um, but when you go and actually get the website, you're not getting it from Google. Google directs you to the actual website. So it's following the same kind of paradigm. Okay, so now I want to go through each one of those parts in a little more detail, provide you a little more detail. Um, so this is the work of David Tarbertson and Jeff Horsborough um, at Utah State University. Uh, Hydra server, it, one of the main contributions here is this uh, observations data model, and it's described in this uh, publication. It's essentially metadata for describing observational data within hydraulic science. So when you take an observation, you need to be very explicit about what that observation is. What are you measuring? Where are you measuring it? How was it measured? Who measured it? When did they measure it? Um, all these metadata are just critical for understanding what that uh, data value represents, especially when you want to share it with someone who, who didn't actually directly collect the data. So that metadata was thought through very closely by David and his team and uh, resulted in this observations data model. There's a bunch of software that uh, facilitates the uh, automatic harvesting of information off of sen sensors and loading that into um, the database. There's tools for visualizing the information within the database. And these are all uh, open source software that are available from our website. And you can download, install, and use. And a number of people are using it. Um, the other piece of the software here with Hydra Server is um, this piece, and this is the, the web service piece. Okay, so like I said before, all the Hydra servers live in different geographic locations, but they all have a standard interface um, that allow client applications to go and query data from those databases. So with an analogy here back to CSDMS, you have models. Models have a standard interface. Okay, so this is something that Scott's talked about a number of times. And that componentizes that model and allows it to be used within a larger software system. So it's the same idea here. We have our particular interface here for uh, exposing information that is stored in these observational databases. Uh, the data that, so we call the actual interface itself Water OneFlow. And it's basically, you could think of it as a set of functions. Uh, get sites. So get sites will query the database and return to you all the sites that are stored within that database. So this is kind of a metadata type of search. Or you could say get values and you can say I would like to know the t this particular time series and it will deliver that time series back to you. We designed uh, this particular data transmission language called WaterML and this is a, an XML based file format that fully describes the time series so that client uh, applications can access that information, understand it, and properly interpret it. Okay, I have to, okay. A little more detail here on these two critical pieces of the infrastructure. Um, because these interfaces and these data communication languages are so important for creating these types of systems, um, the Water OneFlow web service is listed here and all the different uh, functions that are available. And um, this isn't a, a complete list, but it gives you an idea. And this gives you an idea of what the WaterML file would look like. So you can see that self-describing. This is a particular site, the Colorado River at Austin, Texas. It's a, a USGS, National Water Information System site that we are harvesting and providing through our system. It's got a particular lat long, and you can see the data values as well. 
So these are XML files. You can open up, up with a text editor, but more importantly, there's software that knows how to parse that information automatically and, and, uh, and, and operate on that information with uh, kind of object-oriented programming languages. Uh, here's one more example here of zooming in on the actual NWIST data for a response for uh, just describing what the variables are and then the actual values. You could have all kinds of attributes for qualifiers, uh, date, time, et cetera. Okay. Now, once we have all this information, one of the main challenges is everyone's got their own way of describing information, okay? So even across federal agencies, of course, there's not completely consistent ways of describing information. So we handle that with something called an ontology, which is essentially a way of mapping concepts. So you might have a concept such as stream flow, and that concept of stream flow might be uh, expressed using different vocabularies across different um, databases, but they all mean the same basic concept. Right? So in order to search on this catalog, if we don't require people to use particular names, we can't tell the USGS exactly how to name their variables, then we use this idea of an ontology to be able to map between different concepts uh, and to facilitate search within this distributed database. Um, and so just to give you an idea of the amount of information that we have indexed right now in, in HIS Central, there's 66 different services, so you might think of these as 66 different uh, servers out there with information. Um, 18,000 variables, 1.9 million sites, 29 million different series, time series, and 5.1 billion values. And it's growing every day. People set up new servers. It's international, too. We have servers that are, there's nothing that restricts it to the United States. Um, and it's free. Anyone can, you can, if you wanted to, set up your own server, uh, tell San Diego about it. It will go and index it, and it will become part of this system as well, become a node within the system. Just to give you a little taste of, of what information's in the system, so we kind of took out some of the data and plotted in Google Earth here. This is uh, USGS instantaneous data. So these are the USGS gauges that are measuring data in real time and report information about every 15 minutes. Um, 80 different variables that the USGS provides this way at just over 11,000 different sites. Um, the way that this works with our system, by the way, is USGS um, has, obviously they maintain their own database. They don't adopt our database standard. So we create wrappers around their database. That essentially what happens when you make a request and you want USGS data, that request is, is uh, translated at San Diego and then passed on to USGS. Now, what's the advantage of this? The advantage of this is uh, we've had instances before where USGS changes slightly the way they do things. Right? And if you're depending directly on USGS for your information and they've tweaked it just a little bit, uh, it breaks your application. But we can, if everyone's dependent on San Diego, San Diego quickly fixes it, um, and then all the client applications. So it's kind of a middleware. James talked about middleware before. So it's kind of acting as a middleware within the system. Uh, we also have indexed uh, the National Climate Data Center uh, weather data. Uh, that is um, North American scale data, I think probably global scale data as well. It gives you an example of a global scale data set. Uh, these URLs here are where the web services are. Okay, So if you open this up you would, with a browser, you would see a bunch of XML, which doesn't really help you, but from the uh, software perspective, there are tools that know how to render and work with those particular types of documents in order to call those functions. So that's kind of your unique identifier to where this data set lives. Um, also want to make the point here that you don't have to do these large scale data sets. This is a USDA uh, exper experimental watershed within Idaho, I believe. Um, yeah, Idaho, and so again, anyone can sit, it's an open system, so anyone can go and set up their own Hydra server and put their data into it, index it within the system, it becomes searchable within the system. And one of the main focuses, because it's NSF funded, is uh, experimental watersheds that are set up through by hydrologists. So here's one example of that. There are many examples um, of these different experimental watersheds within the system. 
Dry Creek Experimental Watershed and um, observational data that being collected at that experimental watershed are, are put into the system as well and ac accessible to anyone um, through the system for analysis. So our primary application for viewing and accessing the information is called Hydro Desktop. This is built on an open source GIS system called Map Window. And it, the emphasis on our software is really to be user friendly. And so there's uh, tutorials and wizards that help you go through the process of, of, of querying for information. So you can kind of zoom into a particular area, have start end dates, do keywords. You can limit it if you're only interested in a particular set of a service, you can limit to what services it searches over. Um, so if you only trust one particular data source, for example, one of the questions we get a lot is, if you let all the people play in the system, how do you know if the data is any good? Well, one way is you can always limit your searches and say, well, I just want data from a federal database. And so you can, you can make sure you get that, just that information out of the system if that's what you are interested in. Uh, the data will be delivered back to your desktop and stored locally. So you kind of search the cloud, if you will, for the information you want, find what you want, and it goes and downloads into your, uh, into your workspace. So this uh, is, brings up the point where I've been working on the project. So I've been working on an application that's in many ways similar to what's happening here in, in CSDMS, uh, component-based modeling. Um, we call this system, this is, so James talks about how he's poor. Uh, this is basically done by a graduate student in my group. So we built, we leveraged very heavily on the open modeling interface, OpenMI, and we built a plugin into Hydro Desktop. And essentially what we're doing here is um, allowing researchers tools and techniques that allow you to kind of take individual processes or large models put them into this, this modeling environment. Um, OpenMI provides a lot of the functionality for passing and linking information between different components. Um, we have developed this database reader component. So the data you go and download from Hydro Desktop is sitting in your database, and this provides access to that data archive to any kind of model that you have within the system. Likewise, we built a data writer, very simple. So when the model goes and calculates something, so Pim and Monteith is going to go calculate some uh, potential evapotranspiration, you can go write that back to the database. Okay? Uh, there's other tabs within Hydra Modeler for viewing the data geographically, temporally. Uh, you can view it as tables. So it's a very interactive type of environment we're trying to build. Um, and my primary motivation here with building this is, is really kind of for educational purposes. Uh, for teaching hydrology, basics of hydrology, to get those individual components for allow students to swap out the individual components and to really kind of see within the, the big box of what the hydrology model is doing and, uh, and isolate individual pieces. I think this gets to the component-based idea. There's a lot of merits from a science perspe perspective as well as really going in and testing individual pieces of the model, testing how the model would work if you changed out certain pieces, if you had a new way of doing evapotranspiration and you wanted to see what a difference that would make within a larger framework of a model, it's relatively easy to swap out a component, put in your new component, run it again and see uh, what the result would be. So this is also freely available through the Hydro Desktop uh, website and uh, we have some tutorials too that walk you through a few basic examples. Uh, just a quick word here about OpenMI, this is the technology that we're building off of. Uh, so CSDMS is, is close to OpenMI compliant. And essentially what this is, is a EU-funded initiative to try to think about how you couple models together within component-based modeling. And this might seem trivial to you, I don't, I don't know, uh, but it's, there's a lot of software and ideas that go behind how you do this exchange of information. How do you describe information when it's being passed between different models? Uh, the what, where, and when of individual values so the two models can properly interpret the information. There's all kinds of regretting re uh, that might have to happen. Uh, as been mentioned a number of times here at this conference, uh, open to mind, one of the differences is it's more a kind of object oriented in terms of how it views or vector oriented in terms of how it views space. So you have things like polygons and polylines uh, representing elements within a model, or you could have uh, 
a series of polygons representing a groundwater model, and you have to do some kind of remapping to, to exchange the information between the two. But a lot of that is handled within the OpenMI environment for doing those types of data exchanges. One of the things we've been working on, this is the work of Tony Castronova, who's a PhD student in my group, is lowering, lowering the barrier to getting into these component-based environments. Um, it's, OpenMI is really a software engineering tool, and so it's intimidating for uh, civil engineering grad students to really get in there and start to do stuff. So we tried to uh, simplify this, and we have a paper about our, our approach that we published last year in environmental modeling and software. We call the simple model, simple model wrapper, and it's in a lot of ways analogous to what's happening in CSDMS. We have initialized perform time step finish, which is very similar to uh, the IRF paradigm within CSDMS. We have a procedural model, the actual code, the data, and any kind of supporting libraries for that. We dump a lot of the metadata into what we call an XML uh, configuration file that describes the inputs, the outputs, the data exchanges that are available for this component. And then we take this little piece here and we wrap it with an open OpenMI interface. Okay? So one of the things I want to show later is uh, I think one of the core ideas we can think about with all these different modeling frameworks that coming, are coming online is what does this core piece look like? that can be wrapped and exposed with multiple different types of interfaces. So maybe you have an OpenMI interface for your component. Maybe you have a CSDMS interface for your component. And so the core library, the core code, can be uh, interoperable between the different modeling frameworks. So we're not all writing the same uh, Henry Monteith uh, equation in, in, in each of the individual uh, environments. So let me show you an example here of how this works. Um, so this is the Coweta uh, watershed, which is just over the border in North Carolina. And this is experimental watershed that's been running for a number of years, decades. And what we wanted to do is just show how this might work from beginning to end with the HIS and doing modeling. So we set up a, a hydro server for Coweta. We loaded in some of the data that were available there for uh, precipitation, air temperature, stream discharge. This work has been done by uh, two grad students in my group. Mustafa built a lot of the components I'll show, and Tony's done a lot of the um, software engineering that was necessary to pull it off. So viewing the information in uh, Hydro Desktop, again, it's a GIS-based viewer, so you can see the actual watershed. Right? We're going to simulate uh, this particular catchment here, which is watershed number 18. Uh, the dots here are information that we went and retrieved from the Hydro server. So we went through the series of searches that are available within the Hydro desktop to go and find information that's relevant for the study area, download it, and the whole process is seamless and it automatically downloads it into the database and data structure that's sitting behind uh, Hydro desktop. So the way I think about modeling, and of course there's many different ways of, of doing this, I like this explanation from Keith Bevan in his book, Rainfall Run Runoff Modeling. Um, start from the very beginning, you know, how do I perceive this system to be working? Okay. How do I want to express my perception of how the system is working in terms of equations? Okay. I need to code up those equations. There's different options for doing that. I need to make sure I have parameter values that allow me to reproduce some historical data. Okay. Did it work? If yes, good, you're done. If no, you need to go back to any one of these steps. Okay. And I think right now we go back to this step. We do calibration a lot. Um, maybe we need to make it easier to go back to those previous steps as well so that we can really think about the system all the way back to how we perceive the system to be working. Um, five minutes. Okay. So do I have the right processes? Do I have the right representation? Are there any bugs in my numerical code? All this process needs to be exposed so that the modeler can see and kind of play around. Very interactive is how we envision this particular application working, again, emphasis on education, but also for research as well, to test out new ideas about individual processes within a larger system. Okay, so uh, HIS isn't just for Hydro Modeler. 
So there's an API, as I said before, and our vision here is that HIS will be a piece within multiple different frameworks. And so we've been working with Scott to do this. So this is uh, a CMT, and Scott uh, wrote an application here called uh, HIS Data, so it's a little component. And essentially all it does is uses the web services I talked about before. You can query for information within the HIS. It will go and download it, and there it is sitting for you, ready to be input to other components within CMT. All right, so this is a good analogy of how we want to HIS to be kind of serving multiple different modeling environments. Um, so here, the path forward for what I think we need to be doing, my last point, okay? What are the core ideas here that are common against the different modeling frameworks? How do we get to that core concept so that model components can be shared across different environments? So this is the OpenMI interface here. And then within CSDMS, we have a direct mapping between the different methods. That makes it pretty easy to take a CSDMS component and bring it into OpenMI. Right, so this is, Robert's actually an undergrad student who came, who I kind of said, maybe we can use CSDMS components within OpenMI. And so he's mapped out this idea for how to do that, and he's starting to implement it now. Um, I think I'll skip this one. I just wanted to make the point here uh, of scaling up to even larger models and some work that we're doing with ESMF and OpenMI interoperability. But since I'm running a little on time here, I think I'll skip over that one and just finish here. Uh, if you think about where things are heading, at least in the HIS team, we definitely think OGC is kind of the place that things are heading. So OGC is a standards organization, uh, and OpenMI, Quasi through WaterML, Threads Data Server are all kind of being compliant here to some degree with, with OGC or working towards standards through OGC. So we want to think about Earth system modeling and integrating data across different Earth science disciplines. We need standards across these disciplines, and what we're seeing, at least in our community, that maybe is OGC is, is the right place to go for that. So in summary, I really wanted you to know two things. Uh, get some background on HIS. Uh, it's really about standards for exposing information, and then software we've built that helps you uh, use that information. And secondly here, uh, you, know, you might think standards and protocols are pretty boring, but if you want to do all this kind of cross-disciplinary earth science analysis, getting those standards and interface specifications exactly agreed upon is the key for making all the systems interoperable. So I will stop there. Thank you very much.